Hello, my name is Brendan Berry. I am a client manager on the mental health and addiction recovery services team at Music Cares. Just to tell you briefly what Music Cares is, we are a safety net for anyone and everyone that's a professional in the music industry. We are very fortunate to be able to offer support in a variety of ways to musicians who might be struggling or any professionals um, in the music industry. And so under the umbrella of health and human services, we have our health department, uh, our human services team, and then my team, mental health addiction recovery services. Our health services team will help provide people with grants to cover the cost of health and dental treatment. Our human services team will help people with basic living expenses. If you're having a difficult time paying rent, mortgage, car payments, your uh, equipment is stolen because your tour van has been broken into, we will help cover the cost of replacing some of that equipment um, and, and beyond. And the mental health and addiction recovery services team, which is near and dear to my heart, we will help get people into treatment and cover the cost of that treatment, whether that's inpatient residential treatment, uh, intensive outpatient or regular outpatient. If you're struggling with sex addiction, cross addictions, eating disorders, we will help get you treatment. If you are just in need of financial support to cover the cost of individual therapy, we can provide a grant that will cover, cover some of your therapy. Um, and if you are just unsure of what you need, but you know that you need help, give us a call and we'll help you figure that out. We are professionals who have been doing this for a long time and we're connected with providers, treatment centers all over the country. We love, love, love being able to help this community. And it's so important to us. And it's so important to the community because, you know, oftentimes in life, we don't have that safety net. And it's we're very fortunate that Music Cares is, is here to be able to provide that. Um, so with that, I would like to introduce our incredible panelists who will be joining us today and then our host. So we have J.D. Daugherty. Uh, J.D. is an American drummer and songwriter most known for his work with Patti Smith. J.D. has played and recorded with countless music legends, including Billy Idol, Tom Verlaine, Willie Nile, Joey Ramone, The Church, and Indigo Girls. And we also have the incredible Sophie Holly Weld, who is one half of the two-time Grammy-nominated dance music duo Sophie Tucker. And then our host for today is Elia Einhorn, who is the creator and editor of Sober 21, which inspired this series. Elia is the host of Pitchfork Radio, Sonos Radio, and Talk House Radio and TV. And then Elia is also a brilliant musician and record producer. With that, Elia, take it away. Brendan, thank you, man. Thanks for that intro. Thanks for gassing us up. It's so amazing to be here with everyone. JD, great to see you, man. Welcome to the show. Welcome to me too. And uh, thanks for being invited. <laughs> Sophie, so great to meet you. Thanks for joining us. Of course. It's so beautiful to be here with an icon of a new generation of dance music in in your work, Sophie, and then also with, uh, with you, JD, a punk legend who's been sober longer than our dance icon has even been alive, I think. Um, so we've got some fantastic folks here. Now, this Sober 21 and Music Cares collab is a series of conversations that shares how musicians can recover from addiction and also how some folks are able to sidestep addiction entirely, even though they're working in an industry that unfortunately often still celebrates excess, right? So to that end, I'd love to kick things off talking briefly about what role alcohol and drugs played in each of your lives. and why you decided to leave them behind. Sophie, let's start with you. So alcohol and drugs haven't played a huge role in my life, actually. Um, I moved around the world as a kid. And when I was in high school, I was living in Italy. So the drinking age was a lot younger. And I started drinking a lot when I was in high school. I mean, I guess that's pretty normal, but... <laughs> um, by basically sophomore year of college, I was just like, this is just not for me. Um, it does not feel additive to my life. In fact, it feels very subtractive to my life. And it wasn't because of, you know, an, an addiction issue. It wasn't, 
I mean, it was definitely excess, but it wasn't, um, it wasn't your typical addiction story, I suppose. Um, it was more just like a slow realization that all of the things that I was working towards, um, alcohol and drugs felt like they were making my work a lot harder. So like I was, you know, I, I became a yoga teacher my sophomore year of college and in yoga school, you know, we were like learning to become present and more conscious and um, notice the way that our body was feeling. And every time I would drink, I just couldn't do it as well, you know? So like, it was like all of these small sort of chipping away of um, realizations that it just wasn't being additive. And um, ultimately, you know, it took me a couple of years to entirely quit, I would say, or entirely divest from the peer pressure of it all. Um, and it was really because I moved to New York to form a band. And, you know, my band is uh, in dance music, which involves a lot of late nights at the club um, with a lot of people who I barely knew. And I just realized that involving substances that would take me out of my honestly control and um you know best intuition um was just going to hurt me and so I stopped everything when I was 21 um so I've been sober now for 10 years and oh my god yeah Congrats. it's one of the best, best decisions I've ever made and I yeah continue to feel really grateful to my younger self that I decided to do that I mean, what an incredible foundation you built for yourself in order to launch Sophie Tucker. You had already stepped aside from it by that point. But, you know, you, you touched on this quickly. Your music really is synonymous with clubs, with festivals, both of which are notoriously party centric spaces. And, you know, needing to inhabit those spaces professionally, I wonder how do you not only protect your sobriety, but go further than that and actually enjoy yourself in those spaces. Yeah, uh, I enjoy myself thoroughly. Uh, it's really, it's like a superpower, I think, to be able to go out and not do any of the substances because first of all, it gives you endurance. Uh, it means that you're not gonna have a hangover the next day and it's yep. <laughs> like going out. And then second of all, like, the um the i don't know how to describe it but like the the presence i feel i mean it's been so long that it's like it's just something i just sort of don't think about anymore but i remember when it was first evolving and i first started being at the club without drinking like that moment when everyone else like sort of starts you can see the like the slow decline <laughs> yeah cognitive um facilities and like when you are in that environment and everyone else is starting to go through that process whether it's a decline or an uphill whatever however you want to see it um it, it, the like lack of inhibition that follows like I get to experience that too um <laughs> so sometimes I'm it's almost like um not like secondhand smoke it's like secondhand you know high or whatever <laughs> where where everyone else like their inhibition in a certain way usually assisted by something and then I get to do the exact same freaking thing and I get to this point whether it's just because of the music or surrounded by people who are also like not giving a fuck anymore you know about how they're being perceived it's uh I love the environment. Like I love dancing and I love talking to people. And um, uh, I think it's really a, a core part of what we do is that, you know, my bandmate Tucker also like is participating in, in substances sometimes. And uh, I'm not like blowing up his spot, blowing up his spot. No, no, it's great. I, kidding, I, I kidding, love yeah. it, you know, cause I, I don't want to be like, I don't, I don't want to be the type of um, sober person who just doesn't participate at all or tries to create environments that are like purely sober. I think 
and mixed environments are the best where you can sort of like really choose your own path for the night and completely without judgment you know from everybody on I'm, that's that's the kind of environment that I like to be in and uh I yeah I love going out and I love everybody thinks that I'm always on so many things because I'm <laughs> pretty I'm pretty uninhibited um as it is oh that's great and, and it's so rad to hear you talk about being able to have that communal experience that I think so much of dance culture is predicated on without any of the uh, the bullshit, without having to have anything in you except for the music to do that. Um, now, JD, I know that your experience is a little bit different than Sophie's. You did have some uh, very serious addiction issues. I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that and a little bit about what led you to recovery. Yeah, uh, thanks for all of that. That was great to hear you. And um, yeah, I'm like kind of an old school dude, you know, I was like uh, starting to play music in you know, the 70s in New York City. And, you know, what it was like back in those days, it was, you know, pretty, uh, pretty much of an outlock sort of culture where, you know, not only everything was permitted, it was encouraged. So, you know, um, but I didn't really need any encouragement. <laughs> and, uh, you know, when it, it really started to work for me in my, in my early twenties, uh, it just seemed like the key to life. You know, it was really magic. It was like, oh my God, when I got that click of, you know, what that stuff does for you in your honeymoon period, it was like, Oh my God, you know, I've been cheated. You know, it's like, this is what I should be doing all the time. Uh, because that felt like sanity to me. It felt like a really mm. good, but, um, you know, the ratio of like, uh, you know, what it does for you and then what it does to you just sort of gradually went like that to the point where it went from, you know, it actually, I think it helped me creatively because I wasn't so preoccupied. It quieted down the voices in my head which are, strangely enough, all about me. <laughs> <laughs> I know that's weird, but uh, it, it made me feel more comfortable in my own skin until it didn't. And then it got pretty gnarly, you know. Um, and then, uh, you know, I was afraid to stop. Um, I, I thought, you know, what's it going to be like, you know, without this experience, even though it hadn't been any good for about five years. It was just so terrifying to like step out of that world and then when I finally was able to it was like oh it's like the best thing that ever happened but man it took me a long time to get to that place and a lot of other people didn't get to be that place I feel very lucky yeah yeah I mean I'm yeah I didn't wear this on purpose but I'm wearing a DJ screw shirt you know someone who unfortunately never was able to find the other side of addiction of a brilliant artist but who who passed too young Jay I wonder where were you at in your career when you decide to get clean? Were you on the road with Patti Smith? Were you playing with one of the other legendary artists you've worked with? Um, well, you know, that sort of honeymoon period started at the beginning of the Patti Smith group, which was about okay. five. By the time the group had ended in about 79, <laughs> it had become a problem. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then, you know, I did the best I could, but. Uh, you know, with the other people I'm playing with, but I, I did this one show with Tom Verlaine in Paris at the Moulin Rouge. And I remember starting with, you know, playing the, the, the set started with the song with the drums. And I suddenly was like, oh no, and, you know, this is not gonna be good. And the next thing I remember, I was leaving the gig with the guitar player and saying, how, how was the show? And he's like, yay, come on, man. It's like, you know, playing a whole show in a blackout. So oh, no. that's the level it was kind of at, but um, yeah, so, you know, that's kind of how it was. Sophie shared how for her yoga was such a good replacement for um, some of the drug use that she'd been engaging in and drinking. I wonder for you, Jay, what did that look like? Did, how did you replace that feeling that you talked about that, that honeymoon, those, those beautiful times, what did you find to fill that space? 
Well, you know, I don't think that there's anything that can really kind of replace that particular thing on the Natch, but, you know, it has to be worked at. Um, you know, getting to the place where feeling comfortable enough and having done enough, you know, introspective work to uh, be able to help other people. That's really been part of, you know, very key to me um, to be able to, you know, share experience of like, you know, I had a problem, this is what I did about it, to people who might be interested in that. I actually uh, became a certified addiction recovery coach in New York State. So I know a little Boom. bit about, um, yeah, it will be. And uh, yeah, it's a piece of paper, but, um, you know, to be able to turn that into uh, something that maybe can be of use has been, you know, been a huge part of it for me. That's, but it's just kind of the freedom uh, to live life like on the natch and like deal with, uh, you know, <laughs> with life as life is, you know, as it appears. So, which is a challenge, but that's you know, it's a good challenge. It's powerful to hear you talk about your work with other people in addiction and your help with them. You've, of course, been a huge help to me over the decade plus now that um, you've been a sober mentor to me. And Sophie, you've done a lot of work speaking out to help others as well, um, both speaking on panels about your experience of sobriety and, and what it's funny to say could be called an alternative lifestyle in, in the pop mainstream, right? Because it's it's not it's not normal. Um, you have this song, Original Sin, which is one of your band's biggest hits. Uh, and you sing a hurting hand is just connected to a hurting soul. It's not your fault. If you're a hurting heart, sometimes it happens with the more you know, I wonder how did you get to that perspective? And how do you find yourself in your daily life helping others who are in pain? Well, interestingly, I feel like that lyric actually has to do with hurting other people when you're hurting. Um, oh, totally. Hurt people, hurt people. Yeah. Wait. So your question was, how do I, how do I feel like I'm, I'm being of service to other people? Yeah, because obviously by singing that, you have almost inverted its power, and it becomes, it may be a song about hurt people, hurting people, but it becomes a song about helping each other and it becomes this sort of light at the end of the tunnel for people who are in pain yeah i feel like ultimately it's sort of like a song about grace you know just having grace for people and realizing that when people are uh, hurting other people there's something behind that which is that they're usually hurt people and you know one of the one of the other lyrics is like what the fuck is original sin like it's not it's not of course there's, yeah. something, wrong with you. there's something wrong with you too like all of us are constantly making mistakes we're constantly trying our best with what we were given. We're, we're, you know, nobody is without some type of trauma. Nobody is without some type of hurt that they're like inadvertently and unconsciously then playing out in other ways for, for other people. Mm -hmm. So I think that, yeah, I mean, that was written at the height of the pandemic when especially people who are living with people they love, you know, and hurting each oh. other the most. Totally. Um, and then like, I think sometimes also, the more people were then kind of getting into the doom and gloom of what was happening in the world, then the harder it was on people's souls and, and then harder it was on their personal relationships. So yeah, just having that, I think I would say the, the whole song is just sort of like having grace for everybody, including yourself. I wonder because you're so open emotionally in some of your lyrics and because you speak so powerfully about your sobriety and about your lifestyle choices to to be healthy and, and this is a question for you too jay as someone who has been public about your sobriety do you all have fans reach out to you whether that's at shows or via social media to talk about things they're going through addiction or or other difficulties in life yeah all the time and i i, I would say almost more so recently it's not just fans it's actually a lot of other artists like other artists know that I'm sober and and know that I'm still you know going out and participating in the sort of social life and touring life 
And I really, really like being this role for people sort of like secretly. I'm, you know, I'm like, you let me know when you're ready to have this conversation. I'm here. And then yeah. It does usually come around. And I like, I, I don't really make it. I try not to make it too public, but just public enough where if people um, are looking for a resource, they know that I can be a resource. And, you know, I, I'm so glad that, that Music Cares is existing and having these conversations. And I also think, you know, the industry has probably made a lot of improvement. Um, we've all seen every music documentary ever. It always ends the same way. Like that narrative is boring. It's happened a thousand times and it's like, it's time to write a new one, but we're also, we have a lot of work to do, I think in revolutionizing the music industry. And I was talking to a friend about it yesterday. Like it's not, it's not our fault. Yeah, uh, it's a, it's really hard. Like put anybody in this everyone always says to me they're like I don't know how you do it I could never do it I'm like me neither like uh, I'm the same as you like when you tell me like oh my god I don't know how to how you do it all the time and you travel all the time uh, I, I can never do it I'm like yeah it comes with a huge cost like and and because I'm sober I feel all of it which sucks <laughs> like your body's not supposed to change time zones all the time and your body's not supposed to stay up and DJ from five to 7 a.m with bright lights in your face and then get to the airport in the next morning and then fly to another continent like it's just what we're putting ourselves through uh while it is also literally my favorite thing on the planet and I could not be more grateful to do it it's also really hard so the fact that people are then going to choose to numb themselves is no accident and not their fault. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, Sophie, one of the things you're talking about is just kind of the the overall challenges that face the the music industry and that, you know, it's it's a difficult space for people to feel like they can get sober, that they can pursue sobriety, recovery. Um, certainly one of the things that I've experienced as a person in long-term recovery and having chosen some years ago to be very open about that is that I now am a face and a voice in, to recovery. I'm now an ambassador to recovery in some way. And so countless people in my life have come to me asking for that support. And in some instances, like you're talking about, it's like, hey, whenever you're ready. You know, like I remember I had someone at a wedding come up to me and they were very drunk and they said, man, I can't tell you how, how much I admire the fact that you're able to do this and that you're sober. And they're like, I just can't do it yet, not until I retire. And I was like, okay, well, whenever Oof. you're ready, you know, we can have that conversation. They're retired now for like five or six years mm -hmm. and uh, the conversation has not been had. But I think particularly in the music industry and in general, the stigmas around addiction have been such a massive barrier. You know, it's like whether it's cultural or the media, the way in which addiction is presented is it is it in such a, a salacious manner that it's very difficult for people to feel like, how am I going to cross the threshold into recovery? Because now I'm taking on this, this label and this burden of being this awful person. And, and in reality, it's like, there are three sides to addiction. It's, it's either like, and, or just using substances, but like there's the using, right. And if you have substance use disorder functioning in this place of kind of like endless despair or just numbing oneself, uh, living in this subtractive space, um, then there's the other side of it is, you know, for someone who's really got this disease, death, and then the other side is is sobriety. Um, and for some folks who are really suffering, like JD was talking about, you know, there can be such this beautiful uh, process of entering a new life. And Sophie, you talked about the way that it's enhanced your life. So, um, you know, I think the fact that like Music Cares is, is opening up this space for us to have these conversations, again, putting a face and a voice to recovery, normalizing these conversations and saying like, hey, you know, like this is something you can do. This is something you can achieve. And it can be a beautiful, life changing, life altering thing. Um, so I, I really, really appreciate both of you, all of us being a part of this conversation today. Amen. Amen. And, and you know, to that end, I wonder, Jay, what's your experience been like? I mean, you've been sober a number of years now. I want to say a few decades, a few and a half. I've been sober all day, man. <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, yeah, you know, it seems to happen if you just you know, keep at this thing. And one, one thing they don't tell you is you continue to get old. But, um, yeah, you know, I, I don't have a very, as a side man, you know, a pretty low public profile. But sometimes people contact me through, uh, you know, social media and want to know more about it. And I can point them in the right, right direction or just, you know, share what happened to me, with me. But mostly it comes from outside of music, just from people like me, uh, you know, in regular walking around civilian life. So um, I don't have the, you know, the broad expansive uh, situation that Sophie does of like really being out there and being young. And plus, you know, being this old, I mean, if you're this old, uh, you know, if you have, you know, you probably don't have uh, what I have if you're still around, you know. So, um, <clears throat> so the, the chances of me like encountering people who are ready for help is probably a little bit on the less side. But I just wanted to give a shout out to Music Cares too, because not only am I a panelist, but I've been a client too of, of Music Cares has really helped me out. About 20 something, well, 25 years ago, uh, I was in a bad motorcycle crash and uh, with no health insurance. And Music Cares was really, uh, really able to help me in that situation. So it's a tremendous resource. And uh, so I just you know, want to put that plug in for people who might be listening, who are concerned about any kind of problem that, that uh, Brendan discussed. I mean, you should really get in touch with Music Cares. They're really a phenomenal resource of all kinds of help, not just recovery. Absolutely. I'll second that. I, uh, you know, I first encountered Music Cares when I was in a horrific tour accident with my old band, Scotland Yard Gospel Choir. Our, our tour van rolled 12 times as we were going to play a festival. And uh, by the time I got out of the hospital, um, Music Cares was already involved in replacing some of the instruments for some of the band members that had been destroyed in the crash. It was incredible. You know, it's really a powerful thing. And I very much appreciate this platform. So big love for that. And thank you. I, I want to be cognizant of our time. I know we're coming towards uh, the end of our time together. And so I sort of wanted to ask to uh, all three of you guys, to Brendan, JD, Sophie, what is one gift that you've gotten from your sobriety? And what is, oh, okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> what is one gift that you've gotten from your sobriety? And what is one thing that you do regularly to maintain that sobriety? Brandon, let's start with you, man. Uh, I think, I appreciate the question, first of all. I think one of the things for me, it's, it's kind of along the lines of what, what JD was talking about, um, being able to continue to be of service to others. Um, you know, for me, two of my biggest passions in life are music and, and service. And, um, you know, so when I joined the, uh, the crew of sober folks and entered recovery, um, I was encouraged to use my experience to, to help others. And, um, you know, I got, certified in the state of New York to be a recovery coach. I became a master's level music therapist um, and have been able to use music as a, as a tool to help others and use my, my experience and my journey as someone in recovery to help a lot of other folks get sober. Um, and then, you know, if there's such a thing as a dream job, Music Cares kind of was that. It was help folks in the music industry. And that is just an enormous component of, of my recovery to be inspired by, um other folks and them reaching that that place of you know wanting needing and accepting help um so that's a big part of it for me beautiful sophie what about you i would say one of the greatest gifts of my sobriety is my self-confidence <laughs> and i say that because when you're going into a socially scary environment or even just scary environment period, like whether it's on a stage in front of thousands of people or like at a party that you don't know anyone or whatever, like because I've been sober, I've had to really work on my self-confidence in talking to people, mm -hmm. getting on the dance floor first, uh, playing the show 
knowing full well that thousands of people are watching me without anything to sort of like numb the experience or make the inhibition easier and so it's almost like it was um it was making my job a lot harder at first but the the result of that is that like I have a lot of self-confidence when I walk into situations um because I've practiced it over and over and over again and I think that really helped <laughs> um and I think one way that I maintain that is uh, I'm an obsessive journaler, like obsessive, you know, every single day. I've never gone a day without writing. And I think, again, that's sort of like even where my sobriety interest came from. Like I'm interested in knowing what's happening in my psyche. Mm. <laughs> Call it narcissism, but- but It's a know, powerful it's tool. Really, it's, you know, I'm I'm very introspective. Um, and I think that has really helped um, understanding like where everything's coming from. So like, oh, I feel a little weird. Like, let me explore where that weirdness comes from. Um, and instead of like not feeling weird and then not knowing that I was feeling weird, um, it's like the heart, the hardest thing, which is to feel it all and notice it all and uh when you do that consistently and then you kind of get through to the other side you realize that it's sort of like it's like a lot of those hard things it's like you know you whatever do the cold plunge then you just feel like really amazing after or you yes. like, work out and you feel really amazing after it's the same thing like you do the party sober and then you feel really amazing after because you were yourself in a way that um you know wasn't assisted by some outside substance and then all of a sudden like you become more yourself because of that process it's just like this amazing virtuous cycle jd what about for you what's one thing that you've gotten from sobriety and one thing that you do regularly to maintain that sobriety well i guess the one thing that could kind of encompass everything is that you know i have the opportunity to notice sometimes that I am not the center of the universe. You know, <laughs> it's this uh, ability to be free from uh, you know this separate sense of self that like I'm hung up on. So it's like uh, very much in the process of uh, a work in progress of trying to find out what true happiness is, and you know that just that's the whole package right there so that's why i'm still doing it i mean i've been sober for a long time and it's when i originally would hear people say you've been sober that long who would do that you know <laughs> that's, that's crazy you're still doing that and like yeah yeah because i still want to grow you know um i still want to be a more useful you know citizen on this planet and uh yeah so liberation man that's what it's really about and, uh, you know, the one thing that uh, really helps me besides uh, avenues is it has been uh, meditation. Uh, you know, I actually became a certified mindfulness teacher, you know, because mostly to, so I could learn how to do it a little bit better for myself. And it's just so important to, to actually be put my head where my feet are, you know, to be in this moment and to be able to sort of figure out what's the next right thing to do. And that's a <laughs> that's an ongoing process like every day. So, and it's such a privilege to, you know, to be able to be involved in that. And that's what sobriety has given me. It's just an opportunity to, to live life in its fullness, you know? So I guess that would, that would answer your question. Incredibly. Elliot, would you mind answering that question as well? Because I know you've got a, a big life and. Uh... <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, thanks for asking. Um, I think for me, in the context of this conversation, what really comes forward and uh, sorry if you hear these sirens, I guess they're coming to get me, um, Brooklyn. But uh, it was it, the fact that people will fly me around the world to host music radio and television is an absolute fucking gift of sobriety there is absolutely zero percent chance that my career would have happened 
if I was still using and if I was still drinking. There's just absolutely no, I was very dysfunctional. And you know, you, you sometimes hear about people who are high functioning alcoholics or addicts. And uh, you know, I was living uh, with a disease that precluded me being um, functional, to put it, to put it softly. And so the fact that I get to live in music is so incredibly powerful and I'm so grateful for it. And I attribute that to sobriety, the fact that I get to be here with you all right now. And I'd say the one thing that I do every day is I really do work with other alcoholic. Let me, let me rephrase that. The one thing that I do every day is I make sure to work with people who are struggling with addiction. So I'm texting with people on the road just before we all got on to tape this. I was texting with a friend who's on a huge American tour right now. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I mentor people in sobriety. I show them the ropes of how it worked for me and how it could work for them if they want it to. And, uh, you know, I really think of my sobriety as one hand going this way for the new person and one hand going this way for the people who have more experience than me. And, uh, by being in touch every day, I feel like I'm on the beam pretty much all the time. You know, I, I feel grateful for sobriety and, and to the point where I had uh, 26 years sober earlier this year and somebody said to me, congratulations. And I kind of laughed because it's like, it's like, congratulations for not putting your hand back on that hot stove that burned you so terribly so many times. But of course, I appreciated what their intent, you know, um, but it's a beautiful reminder that I don't have to live like that. So I suppose that would be my answer to the question. And, you know, with that, I, I know we're at the end of our time together. I just want to say thank you so much, Sophie. Thank you so much, JD, for joining us, for dropping some knowledge here, sharing some wisdom. And Brendan, thank you for uh, putting this whole thing together with me and, and for giving us the platform. Um, I guess our this will, this talk will be coming out sometime over the summer. Will will you all be on the road? Is anybody out on tour right now? Yeah, yeah. pretty much always out on the road on tour, <laughs> which is something I'm working on actually. Uh, trying to say no a little bit more frequently, um, just to take care of myself in more ways than just being sober. Yep. yep. Um, Well, Sophie, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Uh, there's actually one other thing I wanted to add, which I just is a little please is kind of a curveball, but I feel like it's important for me to add, um, which ultimately is about being a, a contradiction, um, which is like I don't believe that alcohol is inherently evil, um, and I one hundred percent say obviously there's yeah. so many people who. Um, could really use uh, sobriety in their life. And there's a whole lot of people too who are able to enjoy alcohol um, and who are also curious about maybe other ways to enjoy themselves. So I'm actually a co-owner in, in an alcohol brand. Um, Tugger and I are- <laughs> Yeah. I love it. Tugger and I are co-owners in a cachaça brand called Nobofobu. And our whole intention with this brand is basically you know, we're going to be putting out in, in the summer a, a Tucker and a Sophie. And the Tucker is this beautiful passion fruit cachaça made in our distillery in Brazil. It's also supporting, you know, rainforest preservation. It's a beautiful product. It's alcoholic. And then we're also making a mate tea. And it's, you know, super fresh, a little bit caffeinated, not alcoholic. And my goal and intention and, and hope uh, for our shows and for the environments that we create is that people come and they're like, hmm, I could have a mate tea tonight or I could have a passion fruit cachaça tonight or I could even combine them or or I could have neither. But essentially that like, you know, the, <laughs> the kind of black and white I think is very important for some people. But for some people, including, I mean, not me because I'm I'm a little bit <laughs> more in need of a black and white, but I think there are a lot of people who, drinking less would serve them or knowing that they don't have to drink. Um, some people like will not go to the concert because they're like, well, I don't want to drink tonight, but they really want to go to a concert. So they like, come to the concert, figure out how to enjoy it without the al alcohol. Like that will un unlock a whole other part of yourself. And, you know, then maybe 
every six times you go to a concert, you do drink alcohol or whatever it is. And I just want to make sure that there is uh, room for those people too, who are like not necessarily interested in becoming completely sober, um, but for whom moderation would work. Uh, and I, I just think there's a really exciting opportunity actually happening in, in a lot of different industries right now for people who are like sober curious or like, you know, just kind of interested in learning about how their their bodies function. A hundred percent. And I so appreciate that qual that qualifying that because I do think it's important that people don't feel at all like it's demonized. I mean, yeah. to me, alcohol is like religion and that it serves beautiful purposes up to a certain point and then people take it too far sometimes exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, a great, yeah, that's a great analogy yeah and you know most people can enjoy it in moderation it's great yeah alcohol is a you know i'm 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 blessed to be married to someone who is a totally normal drinker she just doesn't like it she doesn't drink because she doesn't really like the way it makes her feels she has zero addiction issues at all and it's so funny um that our brains work so differently you know but um i i, I so appreciate you uh qualifying that this is you know i i think if any both because i honestly believe it and i honestly celebrate some of the benefits that um safe use can bring but also for people who don't have addiction but also who wants to feel judged for that who wants to who wants to yeah. feel judged for for something that is not harmful to them actually you know if they're having a drink that's and they're not an alcoholic who would why would yeah you'd have to yeah, be sort of like non-judgment in all directions like non-judgment yeah. towards you have to say absolutely no all the time, non-judgment to the people who said yes yesterday and say no today, and then switch it around the next time, and non-judgment for the people who, you know, are able to somehow enjoy and still have endurance. I don't understand those people, but uh, <laughs> no non-judgment towards, towards everyone, really. Amen. Amen. Well, for the four of us, we'll be drinking the caffeinated uh, yeah. tea that you're putting exactly. out, and, and for and for those who can safely enjoy uh tucker's drink yeah you go for it we love it um jd thank you so much for joining man great to see you sophie thanks again for being with us today thank you yeah you and, awesome. thank you everyone so much for for coming out and uh if you're watching and you are curious about music cares there's going to be an email address and a telephone number right after this video um give us a shout. We are happy to chat with you, help you out in any way that we can. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, again, really important conversation, finding balance, um, pursuing a healthier lifestyle. And we just have some new perspectives hearing from JD and Sophie and really amazing to hear you guys and your journeys. Mm -hmm.